Hello there. I didn't expect to see you. Yes, it's me. You probably can't quite hear me from over here, so let me try and get a little bit closer. No, 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 no. Don't think that I'm not clawing my way to the bed. That's not how I do things. Well, not right here, obviously. So, shh, okay? I can get across an expressway, okay? I've got it under control, like usual. Oh, shit. I don't think it quite went as planned. Oh, well. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry. No, don't worry, you're not confused. You're not confused. Everything can be explained, just like with all the bruises on my body after falling at a height. Let me just adjust that camera for you. Yes, so everything can be explained. This is not Warlight Raff. This is not the dodgy Warlight Raff. This is Mr. X. Uh-huh. Yes, you know exactly what I'm saying. Mr. X. But this is a more upgraded version. This is Triple X. I know. Jim Terry might be a little bit jealous. I hope he's not choking on his popcorn at the moment. If Jim Terry's here, Mr. X says hello, okay? The original Mr. X has not been kidnapped. He's okay. He's safe and secure in the shadows. So, shh, he'll be all fine. Now, where did the uh, the extra X's come from. Well, went down to Chinatown, the bloody Chinatown Motel in uh, Utah. Utah. Oops, said that wrong. And uh, yeah, those X's were still left hanging about next to the bloody sombreros in a Chinatown motel. Makes total sense there. You know? Oh, honey, how you do? Long time no see. You want these triple X's? Yes, sure you can have Mr. X. I'll give you anything you want. You want a special favor? I'll give you a special favor. No, 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 don't bend over backwards. No, no, please no. Please no. Be be a good boy. Long time no see. Goodbye. Something like that. Anyway, I'm breathless right now. So where do we start? Well, I think the most important thing to do now is to transition over because we don't want Jim Terry choking on his popcorn, having a meltdown, thinking, I know exactly what you're doing, Raph. You know, you've kidnapped Mr. X, there's a conspiracy going on. He's, he's hidden under the bed, he's clawing and scratching where he wants to be freed, man. He wants to escape, but you're not letting him. You're such a bad boy, I'm gonna call the police and I'm gonna come around and knock your door down. To avoid any of that unnecessary chaos from unfolding yes it's time for me to pop my little hat off like this and a little shimmy like this shall work there we go see all under control so anyone that's confused shouldn't be no longer so as i said if you haven't already make sure to check my earlier video out what i did earlier today where it was taking a look at Candy Cooley responding to Brookie and Brookie's claims, okay? Candy gives her own opinion, I'll show a little clip of it, and also, you know, analyse it and give my own points of view too after that. So make sure to check that out, there will be a link down below in the comment section, the pinned comment, right? So yeah, welcome, additionally, if you're currently here in the live chat, I don't know if I introduced that beforehand, but here we are. So you can share your opinions and your thoughts as we go along. Um, I think additionally, I will include a little overtime, like how we did last night with the music and the visual background at the end of the live premiere. So it gives you time to tie up any loose ends, um, send any messages or send anything, whatever it may be, feel free to do so. Um, because sometimes the streams, the, the live premiers can stop and then it prevents people from uh, sending uh, a message or something in the, in a, like a time period. So the overtime helps with that because sometimes some conversations can, you know, play out well and, um, and it's like, oh, they've gone, oh, the end. So that should be resolved now. So basically, I don't know why I'm, I don't know why I'm still breathless. Damn, yeah, I 
okay, might not have done as much exercise as I've done in the past, but it was only rolling across the bed. Wow. But this video is a little similar to the structuring of the last one I did when it was mm, no thanks interviewing Candice Cooley, but completely different points mentioned this time, okay? Different points to back them, which is important. And as well, if I just give my brief opinion on the Mob Crew's live stream talking to Candice, I think it was done much better than mm, no thanks. And the questions as well were pretty good. You know, covered a range of stuff. Dylan, the farm, the surrounding area, certain findings. Yeah, it, it was quite good to, to, you know, to watch. As you know, I hardly watch other people's videos because one, timing, two, the actual length of the videos. But when it's structured, and there's a format to it, yes, it's it's easier to follow along. So those live Q&A ones worked out for a change. And the more up to date, um, it, the probably more beneficial listening to these right now than the ones you may have seen a few months ago. So it all worked out in terms of timing of when I came along to start properly looking into them. On a sideline, I have seen some of Lance's videos too recently, more the continuations of the mines explored. I think there is a key point we will get into when it comes to the mines in this video for exploration. So that can tie on in later. But, you know, when watching those mine videos, you look at the entrances, like the horizontal entrances, they look really small and tight. And you think, how can you fit something in there when it's so tight and small but you know I guess uh, looks can be deceiving because once you manage to break that that entry um, not not illegally I mean but once you're able to break through that small hole you, you wiggle in everything widens and it just it goes deep it goes dark and it goes quite far in and you know, when they have entered, it's like, you know, how far can you go? There's different pathways going off it. There's drops too. So it is interesting to watch. Based off my height and build, I don't know if I could fit in some of those holes. Um, small spaces, does it really bother me much? Um, I've not really been in many situations like that, but probably not something I would enjoy. Do any of you hate small spaces? You know, have any of you seen those videos on YouTube of the extreme cave explorers where it gets really narrow and they're on the, not even on the hands and knees, on the stomach, trying to crawl through like a snake? It, it looks pretty uh, tough, but uh, yeah, I guess you just have to make sure you're the correct height and breathing as well, you know. If you're going over rocks and stuff down a very narrow tunnel and you breathe in and you rib cage and you clap you get slide over a rock and then breathe out, then you kind of stuck on it. So mm, you can get very messy. But less of that, we need to be looking at the mob crew today, the interview. I made some like key points which I believe are kind of important, okay? So if I do look down, it's just because I'm reading the notes as I go along, just little bullet points. It does help. So um, there was a bit of talking at the start, didn't really catch my attention, but when it started moving on to Chase Venstra, that's where I thought, oh, we're getting a similar pattern as we've heard with Brenner. So as we already know, we've heard about James Brenner, the way he's been treated by the police, leniently welcomed, even though he's got a warrant on him, he's done bad stuff, the police know, they've not really been that harsh on him. Something similar, in a way, has happened with Chase Venstra. So I guess you fast forward towards the beginning, around the 25th of May, when Dylan gave Chase Venstra a lift, picked him up down Tacoma Road, back to Montello. And then shortly after that, at a certain point, I think this is uh, to do in the process of when Dylan goes missing, um, the mother eventually knows about Chase Venstra, eventually. 
Um, I think that might be through Kurt, Jim Brenner, when you had a little discussion together confirming stuff. And, you know, Candice wanted to, you know, reach out to Chase Venstra to get answers or just for him to be interviewed by the police so he can give his story to clean things up or just to give his point of view because it might help in the build up to the investigation, you know, it might fix something, it might fill in a blank, um, it might help get him off the hook if he was in danger at some point or treated as a suspect. And from the way it was worded, Candy said Chase Venstra was cooperative with her, you know, phone calls, communication. And um, there was, and Candy said that Chase was like, yeah, you take me to the, the sheriff's office, take me to uh, the department and so I can be interviewed. And basically, Box Elder County, in a sense, wanted nothing to do with Chase Venstra. They were like, no, 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 whatever, we don't need him. That was kind of their attitude. So they dismissed it. One of the key individuals, I think it was a sheriff that stood out, was Zach Moore. Zach Moore refused to interview Chase Venstra, ignoring him like they did with James Brenner. So straight away, we're seeing the same patterns of behaviour and attitude by the hands of the LE towards another individual who at some point was seen as a suspect within the case. So... To you, does it make you think Box Elder County are corrupt and helping Brenner and also looking out for Chase Venstra, considering both have criminal history, have been previously, you know, arrested in some way, apprehended, received punishments, so the police will know about those type of individuals? Do you think it's down to corruption or do you think it's down to incompetence? Because what we're seeing now is more than one person either being treated more leniently or just not really handled with as much care or attention, just written off, dismissed, that they've got nothing to do with it when they could in some way. Leave your thoughts down below. I might even do a poll in between. You can share your thoughts there. So I can understand the frustration building up from that area, whether it be to get the suspect get the person of interest in for questioning because they might know of Dylan or just to simply tie up loose ends immediately like with uh, Chase Venstra being picked up by Dylan so then they can move on to and progress with other stuff and other people but because that didn't really happen I guess mother frustrated then and that was really towards the start so it's just yet another example of towards the beginning where it was a bit of a mess itself so yeah there's that anything else well the 28th this one is interesting okay you i did see on the timeline as well because um when the mob crew was in what's his name chris when chris was showing images on his live stream showing it towards candice he had different dates said the 26th Dylan was at Saddle Saw and then the 27th was blanked out and then the 28th said made his final phone call. I just don't understand why is the 27th blanked out? I thought that was confirmed in the end that Dylan was at Saddle Saw Bar on the 27th and then planted seeds later at night and was seen by the campers as eyewitnesses. I thought that's how it went. Or is it just referring back to the 26th because that's when he visited and he stayed over the night there and then came back on the 27th later on at night? Leave your thoughts in the chat about that. If um, something needs confirming or reinforcing, feel free to do so. That will be appreciated. Also, just to cut in briefly again, um, appreciate the people who... Um, uh, sent the super thanks last night and uh, two new members as well to the channel. It's very good of them to do that. So I appreciate all those people. Um, so yeah, time back in with the 28th, what was mentioned on the live stream. Candy said, sure, Dylan, you know, did call uh, the grandma, as we've all heard, you know, 
I think that was like uh, 6.51 or something in the morning, something a.m. So early in the morning, it makes sense. He's waking up early. He's a farmer, informing friends, family, whoever, what you'd normally do, what's going on in the day, what's ahead. That's all normal. But there was an additional important point Candice brought up, which I've never heard before. Maybe you haven't either. On the same day, before Dylan called the grandma, Dylan attempted to call James Brenner, also known as Jim Brenner, the main suspect within the case. Now, I, I guess it went straight to voicemail or, you know, he didn't pick the phone up, Brenner, whether it be because he ignored Dylan or he wasn't around the phone or he might have had the phone turned off, but Dylan tried calling Brenner. And that was in the morning. Now you might be thinking, why though? Why would Dylan be doing that? Well, from what Candice has said, a uh, possible explanation is Dylan wanted Jim Brenner to pick him up and take him back home later on in the day. Because Dylan, you know, as we know, had his Ford F-150 Burgundy Raptor vehicle parked at his farm, his place of living. Um, and he wanted his grain truck to be parked into the shed, the grain shed, okay, where um, Brenner is squatting at. Now, I don't know if the grain truck was at Dylan's place of living to begin with, and then he drove it down to the grain shed, or it was already near to the grain shed, and then Dylan drove it in. Regardless, that's what he set out to do, and he was successful in doing that, as we've seen and heard. So he parked it in as best as he could to keep the seeds dry. And that phone call, as I said, made earlier on in the day was to ensure that Dylan doesn't have to walk all the way back to his farm to avoid the five miles of walking. He wanted Brenner to pick him up as Dylan's finished at the grain shed and be drove back to his trailer. Simple task. I don't know if it's been done before, or it's like a first time, but that's what Dylan hoped for. And did it happen? Who knows? That's the thing. I can do a theory, a map analysis, a short one about that. Give a few opinions, thoughts, visualizations of what could have happened in that space of time from Dylan making the call to Brenner and then what unfolded afterwards because something might have happened. The favor might have took place but went down the wrong turn for the worse. If you want me to cover that, a map analysis, a little theory one, it's quite a deep one um, in terms of what it could explain, let me know down below and I'll cover that as soon as possible. But yeah, it's just more additional information coming out because I, I was always under the impression he only made one phone call on the day. And ever since, I know some people here and there, maybe like Julie, have wondered, did Dylan make any other phone calls to anyone before that, a day before or so? Well, there you go. He attempted to call Brenner. So, yeah. Anything else? Well, we move on to the next point. Like when they were talking about both Brenner and Don Hatley, that questioning of, was it a Sunday or a Monday when they went out actively searching for Dylan. And it's kind of like, you know, back and forth, hmm, can't really decide which day. But then that reinforces and ties into the next point, an observation that when Candice was out there herself and she was walking around, despite her being a certain weight, much lighter than Brenna and Don, uh, shorter in height, and yet her prints remained in the ground, and yet she couldn't find any other footprints from Don or Jim Brenner. And it's like, well, where are they? If my prints are in the ground and they remain, then why aren't those guys who were there just before me, who are much heavier, creates more of an indentation into the ground, they can't just disappear like that. So what that could highlight is Don Hatley and Jim Brenner never went out looking. They might have 
called in and said that they did or they currently are, but there's no marks, no footprints to prove they were out there. And, you know, it's one of those things where, I think I said it in my previous video or so, that they could be on the phone saying, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll look for Dylan, don't worry. They do that to appear less suspicious, act like they care. Because if you know someone somewhat well, or you live near to someone, and you're supposedly friends, or you get on okay, you, you mutual people, and you're like, no, I'm not going to bother searching for that person, I don't care. It makes you look like a bad person, and then you'll be questioned, you might be arrested. So the best thing to do is to reduce that uh, negative attention. So you help, you step in, act, act like you care and all that. And that's basically what they did, but there was no prints left. So they kind of put themselves in a bit of a hole in a way. And while she can say, oh, well, Brenner, it's no surprise that he didn't go out there. He's probably lazy. He's probably stubborn. He's awkward. He doesn't care about Dylan. And he's the main suspect. No surprise there that he didn't go out searching, despite lying. But you look at Don Hatley, who was supposedly also there doing the same thing. And yet, there's no footprints of him. So he lied as well. Um, you know, some people believe Don Hatley is tied with the disappearance of Dylan. Other people think he's okay because they were friends at some point and the words for each other and he doesn't have a really dark, negative, criminal past history as Brenner. So Don can't, you know, isn't involved in a negative way, but because he's associated with Brenner, are they covering for each other? And if they were both out there searching when it turns out it looks as if they weren't and they were lying. Why are they lying then? That's the main thing you've got to ask yourself. Why did they lie if that's the case? You can leave your thoughts down below. Uh, although, you know, Brenner is the main one still, do you think Don Hatley plays a role in some way? Do you think he's covering for Brenner? Do you think he's grasped up on Brenner, like with the, the whole gun situation? Or is he doing it in a manipulative way in which he's responsible as well, but he throws the other individual under the bus so his sentence or his punishments are lessened because he's done a good deed in a way? Let me know what you think, okay? Anything else? So the phone ping, okay? Still talks about that, the location of it, still agreements of within a 15.4.5 mile radius. The actual epicenter marker still west towards the mountainous area where the ground is white or salty like from when you look at it, aerial view, you remember there. And um, in terms of the location of the phone, based off the way it was worded in the live video, still within that area, although you've got the, the radius which stretches out afar, the main point still where it is that agreement Candice believes it's like in that area because there's no real proper roads close by. So it's like, where would Dylan really be or where would he really be going practically? So I guess, I assume, if I'm correct in saying, based off that language used, the phone ping, the final trace of it, has not changed or moved or no new developments on that yet at this moment in time. If you know something though, or you need to correct me, feel free to do so, but that's just the way I interpreted it. That's the way it was worded within the live video. So uh, yeah, and tying it on with the whole phone situation, it's still not been found. Candice Cooley said that, well, agreed with the point made by Chris, um, saying that, yeah, a few people have claimed that it's been found, but then it wasn't. Then some people saying it's been found, it wasn't. And then in recent time, in one of my live premieres, some people saying the phone was found in a pond, but it hasn't. So it's like, where's this information coming from? Sure, I know you can blame YouTubers and people that watch videos and pass it around, but... Who's the original source of all this information regarding the phone? And why do they keep saying it's found, it's not, it's found, it's not? Or is it just different people each time? So, yeah, 
the phone has not been found yet. Candy said that they did make a clone of it when trying to access accounts, but we already know about that. So uh, yeah, that's it for the phone situation. The wallet is still missing, the gun too. So it still makes you think, are they all in one place? Or were they dumped, separated, spread apart? Or are they on the hands of the suspect? Or were on the hands of the suspect? Um, or are they on Dylan, maybe? Dylan's been dumped somewhere. Dylan might have his wallet in his pocket. Um, his phone too. As for the, the gun though, that must have been dumped somewhere. And with it, with it being missing, it's either like the suspects got a hold of it and took Dylan out that way, or Dylan took the gun with him at some point in self-defense maybe, or he had to go and inspect something that looked a bit suspicious near to his place of living. He might have seen someone lurking about. He might have seen an object out of place or heard a sound nearby and thought, oh, I wonder what's that? I best get my gun for protection. And then something happened. Just trying to understand that still, the whole items, where are they exactly? Um, what else is there? In terms of the tips and rewards, okay, it's kind of like an interesting point mentioned and like what Candy's replied with, you know, started off at $5,000 when it was to do with Chase Venstra, trying to find him. You would have seen some of those posters. I don't know who got that money though, because obviously Chase Venstra has been arrested or was arrested previously. So that bit wasn't answered. Who got the $5,000 reward money for information on Chase Venstra when they were trying to reach out to him? Who knew of him? Who passed the information on? If you know, feel free to let me know. But yeah, that's kind of interesting. And then when it came to the Dylan Brown situation and the money, um, you know, the reward money started off like maybe 20,000 or round about that. Candy's wanted to up it to about 50,000, but Justin said, no, um, we can increase it to 100,000. So, you know, it's climbing quite a lot, but if they can if they can do it, then they can do it. And if they want to, and it's important to them, that's what they'll do. And yet, despite a $100,000 reward, no one reached out with tips, information, findings, you know, serious ones. That's what Candy said. So, you know, if anyone was going to break, crack, throw somebody else under the bus because they could benefit massively financially than they would have done, you know? If it's a friend of someone, a stranger that's heard about a key suspect who is responsible, you would have thought, as soon as they hear about the money, they're like, damn, we're in Montello, it's a rough place, people are strugg struggling financially. If I throw somebody, grasp somebody up, then I can get that money and maybe escape from this place. And yet no one has done. So it must mean that they don't know either, that there's quite a lot of innocent people, right? Possibly. I mean, whilst it's okay saying that oh, no one's reached out with tips from what Candice has said, fast travel back previously to when the $20,000 was put up. At $20,000, that was around about the time Kurt Wadsworth supposedly got a call from a psychic about Dylan being held captive in Montello, either by Robert Avales or um, one of the Wadsworth brothers, one or the other. It was worded a bit differently in uh, this recent live stream. And um, Kurt eventually contacted Candice Cooley, the Rounds family. They all came down. And obviously it fell through, it was a false lead, it was fake in the end. And, you know, due to the process of it, it just highlights that the psychic readers are at most of the time full of BS. And yet Kurt fell for it. Now, is Kurt Wadsworth a level-headed guy? Does he think straight? 
That's what you got to ask yourself. Um, yeah, twenty thousand dollar reward at the time for finding Dylan or information leading to his finding, and that was the time Kurt decided to reach out with a tip, even if it was a bit wild and out there. It makes you think: was he doing it for the money, right? But he's not said anything since, and obviously the reward money has gone up. So you would have thought if he was really desperate, he would have come out with more information now. Though that's not taking place. So does that make him less dodgy, less suspicious? As for Candice Cooley, she did say that she's not ruling like anyone out, but she's not focusing directly on Kurt at this moment in time because there's no need to. So you can make of that however you want. Um, the only other tip that was mentioned was more of a prominent one, and it was fake, was, I think it was around about the time when the 100,000 was introduced, and Candy said in the interview towards Chris that people from Mexico sent in information and a photo of Dylan, photoshopped in Mexico, Mexico, held hostage, saying, you know, give us the money and we'll release him. But, you know, over time they realised it was fake, it was a hoax, it was just people being desperate, wanting money and stuff like that, so it fell through. And then supposedly there was a few of the small scale ones here and there as well with people coming out saying, I've got information, I know where he is. You know, that sort of stuff is expected to happen, even if it sounds bad and demoralising, it's going to happen. You know, if there's money out there, and there's an opportunity to get a hold of it, possibly people will do whatever it takes to get a hold of it. So desperateness and spasmodic spasticity, spasticness will kick in from any age, range or gender. And yeah, that's what happened. So there's not really been any more fake tips since from what Candice has said. So that's a good thing in a way, but you know, there's not really been massive developments either genuine ones so there's that what's the next point candice okay so with the wadsworth brothers kurt wadsworth troy and scott wadsworth you know they have done they have done bad things in the past mainly troy and kurt you know treated even like younger people um people of the opposite gender stalking being a bit physical, that sort of stuff. And they've been arrested in the past, they've served the time. In uh, recent time, there was that, like, as some of you may know, that false accusation or so by Doug from mm, No Thanks, I think I'm correct in saying, saying that Troy, no, Scott Wadsworth was arrested, like, um, so many weeks ago, it might be a month ago now, because of uh, taking drugs or owning drugs at the time but he was never arrested, so that fell through there. But, you know, with the Wadsworth, I can't remember who brought it up now, but some were saying, oh, you're blaming the Wadsworths for their past crimes, their past actions, and trying to associate it with Dylan. It doesn't quite make sense. How can you, if certain things weren't mentioned about the Wadsworth and their history, then no one would really think or tie them to Dylan Rounds. And in a way, yeah, I guess that's true. But, you know, you've got to look at past history and behaviour to see if they're capable of reoffending or doing something similar. If it's of a certain age range, of a certain gender, and Dylan fits that category criteria, then the same acts, reactions by those dodgy people, it might occur again. I mean, if people are looking at Brenner, which they are, the, the family are, the Rounds family and YouTubers, and they keep referring back to Brenner's criminal history of violence, anger, losing control. That's the perfect fit for the outcome of Dylan, considering they know each other, they're in close proximity, and that's how um, Jim can act. Well, if you're looking at and using one's past history to define what they could be doing now, then why are you writing off the Wadsworths in terms of their past history? You might as well apply the same methods there too, and that's like what I've done when I was looking at crime within the area and the actual Wadsworth brothers themselves and what they've got up to in the past. Now, keeping his Candice Cooley in the live stream didn't completely dismiss the idea 
that um, the Wadsworths are, you know, not involved. You know, she doesn't think they're completely innocent. In Candice's words, roughly speaking, she believes that the Wadsworth might know of information to do with the Dylan Rounds' disappearance, whether it be the main suspect, seeing or hearing something, you know, that type of stuff. Not direct, but enough info to cause a lead developments to be made and yet they're not saying anything now this is the thing hundred thousand dollar reward how well off is kurt wadsworth that's what you got to ask yourself people said kurt is a con man but he also is kind of well off compared to the other people in montello you know with owning that saddle saw bar um, he's going to be making money there to an extent. People saying Kurt Wadsworth trafficking or something and grooming. Oh, I'm not going to say it completely because I don't know if YouTube will, uh, you know, punish me for saying it. But you know what I'm saying? All these little methods of making money or a fair bit. If he is well off, I don't know how rich he is, but let's say he was doing pretty well then seeing a $100,000 reward might not mean much to him, possibly. Just saying it like that, because he might think, yeah, there's all that money, but it's not worth the risk. If I or some of my contacts know of something, it's not worth the risk for 100000 Not worth it, because then there'll be more questions, possibly. Because if they're directly involved, or kind of, they're going to throw themselves under the bus, imprisonate, in, imprison, imprison themselves, and that's obviously not practical. So it's just best keeping your mouth shut and sacrificing the money because you've already got enough. I'm not saying that's the case, but if it was, then it would make sense. Um, the only other alternative idea would be maybe one of the Wadsworth brothers knows of something, but the other two don't. And that's just how it is at this moment in time. Um, but with them being brothers, knowing each other, living in the same area, they probably are close, tight-knit, maybe like the Montello community. So they've got some kind of loyalty, some bond, pact, agreement, keep silent, look out for one another, you know, stuff like that. And as I said, Candy seems to acknowledge that, okay? So once again, you can leave your thoughts down below, I might even do another poll, what do you think about the Wadsworth brothers? Do you think they're directly or indirectly involved in the Dylan Rounds case? Do they know of something other people don't know, but they're keeping quiet because they're looking out for someone or looking out for themselves? Okay. So we'll have a small dodgy break right now. Don't go anywhere. No. Who said you could? Oh. <laughs> You hear that noise? You're grabbing the door handle, trying to pull and tug. It's locked, isn't it? It means you can't escape. I'm sorry. But nevertheless, you can still have a break if you want. Um, so just take it in. You can share your thoughts continued in the chat about what you think the state of it. Your overall thoughts of the interview of Candice Cooley up to now. There is still a lot more to talk about, which I'll bring up in a second. Just need to stretch a little bit because my my shoulder is a bit sore from landing before. Oh, if you didn't know, I'm a professional stuntman, aside from a hotel motel reviewer and uh, an ASMR expert and many other things, not. But yes, some people will be confused at this moment in time and thinking, what? How did you you know, hurt your shoulder. Well, I can actually explain and demonstrate right now. Don't worry, I am a good person. I can I can uh, sh uh, share to you. And you know, the other people that saw it happen before, it's like, um, it's like on replay, it won't be of the same extent. But yeah, basically it was like that and it's the way I introduced myself, but I need to get back over there. So um, I'll have to scuttle around. So it's kind of realistic, okay? Now this looks so fucking dodgy. The way I'm doing this. Okay, so nearly there. And like 
Ow. I'm gonna get carpet burnt. So down here, and then I popped up and I was like, oh, hello there, welcome. All the bullshit talking because like, stop waffling God. And then to get to the other side, I did a little transition, but it got carried away. So as I uh, mounted and rolled over like that, I basically fell like that. And then I transitioned over and then I was like, yeah, okay. Who the fuck are you? Where you come from? Have you been there all this time spying on me? A little rat. Who knew that is? Could be anyone. But you get the idea. So, uh, yeah. <sighs> okay. I guess the other thing is that's probably needed by now to catch people's breath. Maybe a blessing time is necessary and not for you, you naughty boy. <laughs> what am I doing? So, I have some water here, obviously. Um, it's wet, okay, and it's the temperature's okay. So, if anyone wants a blessing, feel free to ask for one right now, or maybe don't bother because I'm still going to give it to you anyway. That doesn't sound quite right. Now, last time I did this, and it's like reference as well, it's worth taking mind. When I did give people a blessing and I splashed people with the water and made them wet, um, it also fucked up my mic on the phone. So it sounded like we were suddenly underwater. So I don't want to make that same mistake again. So I'll, I'll go gentle, okay? Don't worry, I'll go gentle. Everything will be fine if you just keep your head still. So, let's see if we can create any ASMR water sounds for the sake of it. Oh yes. Do you see? You hear the sound? Hmm, the hand placement is not exactly appropriate. Well, hopefully you heard the splash in. Oh shit, I've got it on the notes. Fuck. That wasn't supposed to happen. So, there you go. Everyone ready for the blessings? Hallelujah. There you go. There you go. Enjoy. Enjoy all that goodness. There you go. There we go. I think that's, that's long enough now. So let's salvage the paper, which is now wet. That's a shame that. That's my fault for being clumsy. So <laughs> it actually ties on. We're moving on to the water hole now. Isn't that a coincidence? And that wasn't planned either. So Candice brought up, well, I think it was Chris brought up about the location of the water hole. Has it been searched? You know, what's going on in that area? And Candy's response was, yes, it has been searched, you know, quite in depth. It was like the odd sheriff or someone that wouldn't let go of the location because they were fixed on it. It's kind of like a swampy area. Now, when I first saw it in the past on maps, I assumed the hole was that circle thing. But nearby it is trees and it's like almost like a small pond. So that explains that about the whole pond talk previously. I, I originally thought the pond they were referring to was the one at Dylan's trailer, but from the looks of it, it wasn't. Now, in terms of searching the waterhole and pond, it's not that deep. It's fairly shallow. So if you tried hiding the body, it would show up. Even if it did submerge slightly, it would show up. It would be visible. Now, although they weren't successful in finding anything of interest, evidence in the waterhole, the pond area, I mean, if you look further east, there's several other ponds further out there. So it might be worth checking them out. And some of them are a bit bigger and look possibly deeper. So maybe Dylan is there. I don't know if they've been checked or not. That all that left remains unanswered. But we might get down to the bottom of it. Anything else? So they started moving on to Dylan's vehicle, the Ford F-150 Raptor. In terms of it being part of his trailer, his farm the pipes, the way they're wrapped around the 
uh, edge of the car near to the wheel um, it being power washed referring back to that again candy show like a zoom in with the photo so the the downwards of it the pattern of the, the mud or something it looks like there's pressure applied to it downwards such as a power wash so yeah it, it, was, it was like the, you know the points what we've looked at on uh, my channel when um, we're looking at the ground underneath or nearby to the truck of where it looked like sediments, bits of mud washed off and dirt from the vehicle and collected on the ground and was a bit patchy and bumpy because of a power washing in present time, recent time I should say. So it was just talking about that. Though when it came to the discussion about, was it the hose, the fuel tank, one or the other, it was more to, I think it was more to do with the fuel tank itself on the back of the truck, if I'm correct to say. Candice basically said the fuel tank, which was present at Dylan's vehicle, was removed, taken away and given to Don Hatley to help him for his pivots on his farm. So that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, they know each other, I guess they're friends, so helping a friend out, that's normal. But is it normal to do so? during an investigation, an ongoing one, of Dylan Rounds going missing, you know, such as his vehicle and other items, do you think it's a good idea to be taking stuff away, like the fuel tank, and handing it over to Don Hatley, who, although he's doing it for his farming and pivot, could he be using it for any other reason? Trying to get a hold of it himself, to dispose of it, because there's some evidence on it? I don't know. I mean, the way the police has handled things, and certain evidence... And the way Candice was at the start in terms of breaking in the, the back window of the vehicle, it's like there's quite a bit of recklessness going on. So your thoughts in the chat, what do you think? Do you think it was a, a bad idea, Candice handing over the fuel tank to Don Hatley? Do you think it was a bad choice to make or what did it not really impact much at the end of the day? Let me know you, your thoughts on that. Um, anything else? Kurt said Dylan only invited, okay, so this does tie on to the, the whole power wash situation once again. So prior to what we saw with the supposed power washing at Dylan's farm, Kurt and Candice did bring it up that Kurt said it was power washed before that or something, whether it be in Montello or back at Dylan's farm again, likely untrue because from how Candice with it was, Kurt said, supposedly, that Dylan would only be invited to the barbecue on that Memorial Day weekend if Dylan cleaned his truck. Bit of a weird request. I don't know if that's Kurt being stubborn and awkward, but that was the supposed claim. Candice doesn't believe in it. What do you think? Do you believe in it or not? I mean, it just seems a bit weird, a bit silly. Yeah. I can't imagine that. Is Kurt trying to spread confusion, mess up things, or did it did it come out wrong? I don't know. But I don't know why it would really matter beforehand as well, being invited to the barbecue. Like, why? It makes no sense. And as well, Dylan didn't even go to the barbecue because from the way it's been worded by Candice previously and reinforced once again, he was too busy tending to his farm related chores and responsibility so he wouldn't have gone to the barbecue anyway so that kind of closes that one down anything else Brenner okay so let's move back on to Brenner so Brenner did shake hands with the police so you know you got to start the investigation police coming along they'll be maybe asking some questions and communication going on such as with Box Elder County and Brenner. But from what Candy said and witnessed herself, they shook hands, Brenner and the police, like normal. And you can say, well, that's 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 what would normally happen. It's just a normal greeting. You know, no one's proven guilty yet, so you just gotta treat everyone with some kind of respect. But it's not a normal case there, is it? Because you look back that Brenner has a past history of crime, that there is a warrant out for his arrest, 
the police are there right now, not literally right now, but at the time of it unfolding, and they know themselves who Brenner is, they know themselves that there's a warrant, and yet they're perfectly fine shaking hands with a potential killer, but also a former or reoccurring violent man who's severely hurt people and fatally shot someone in the past. And the police are okay shaking hands with someone like that. It does make you think maybe the police are comfortable doing that because they've shook hands with many other people in the past who've done very dodgy stuff. It could be to do with younger people, it could be to do with trafficking, it could be to do with drugs, it could be anything. So could that form of interaction and body language, behaviour, the interaction zone mean that there is some kind of ties going on and understanding and uh, looking out for one another? Maybe. Does seem a bit dodgy, right? Anything else? Candice thinks, yeah, this is, uh, this is um, another point that was mentioned as well. Candice thinks Jim Brenner is more afraid of the Rounds family than the police. Candice was saying that the way Jim was at the start of the investigation, the way he was talking outwards, giving off different ideas and theories, and from his point of view, he was a bit cocky, a bit too laid back, think he might have been a bit untouchable, invincible, but then when the Rounds family started stepping in more and getting a bit more active, from the way it was worded in the interview, that's when Brenner started feeling a bit unsettled and worried that maybe things might come out like uh, with the whole key fob situation, so that could explain to why he returned it back to try and, you know, lessen things, to lay low a little bit in hopes that could happen. But, you know, it's not really worked out in that sense. And if Brenner gets on well with the police, like he's just shaking the hands, if Brenner knows that the police should be arresting him, but they're not at the moment, that's that might be another reason to why he feels comfortable. He's like, even if there wasn't like a direct form of interaction or acknowledgement towards the two groups, two parties. Brenner could be sat there thinking, look at the police around me, they should be arresting me right now, and yet they're not. Huh, I must be too good for them. You know, all things could go through his mind at the time, so he acts different at points in time. Um, in terms of behaviour though, he appeared normal at the start and then down the line things changed, but we can get a little bit more into that later on, okay? So Candice just gave a random thought saying that because of the area, the land, the environment, the way, it, the way it is out there, she thinks that squatters there are odd and antisocial. I mean, they could be odd. They might do dodgy things, odd stuff, who knows? They might all be the same or some might be different, who knows? I wouldn't know because I'm not from there. It's just her opinion at the end of the day. But, you know, it's always worth taking in mind, maybe they are the way they are because of how they were brought up or certain events that might have occurred at a point in time which changed the way they think or how they see people. You never know. That's always a possibility. So um, it's sort of worth taking into mind. I mean, from what we've heard previously, obviously, the way the opposite, uh, the, the females have been brought up in Montello, some of them have retrieved trauma at a younger age, so it's affected how they behave at a later point. So if it can happen for them, it could happen for some of the squatters too, later down the line, who knows? Anything else? In terms of the phone activity, let's just tie back to Dylan Rounds once again, because this is when it was brought up in the conversation of the live stream. Chris was saying to Candice, did anything unusual occur? You know, was there anything dodgy on the phone? Any unusual phone searches, anything that's out of the ordinary. Referring back to Kenny Veach, you know, with the whole suicide theory, when looking on his phone or his search history on his PC, there was a lot of searches made saying, um, I need help, I need help, I need help. That could be interpreted many different ways. He needs financial help, or he might need help to save his life because the way his mind is at, who knows. But that sort of stuff was a bit out of the, out of the ordinary for Kenny. As for Dylan, what Candy said, the phone of Dylan's, nothing dodgy, nothing unusual, same old, same old photos, videos, pattern of uploading to TikTok or Facebook and then showing it to the parents afterwards, that style, okay? Nothing out of the ordinary there. When Chris said, what phone did Dylan have? Candy said, he's got an iPhone. Kind of interesting, it does make you think, what about the iCloud? 
iCloud storage. Has anyone accessed it? I, I don't know. You know, they've accessed the Facebook, maybe the TikTok account, looking for things there, but did they go on the iCloud because that can have storage, photos, media, music, videos, and all that stuff. Let me know your thoughts on that if you know if it's been checked too, because that was unanswered. Um, anything else? Linking back to what I was saying about Jim and his behaviour can be said by the fifth day of the ongoing investigation. The fifth day, Jim started becoming agitated, a little bit moody, a little bit aggressive. Things started building up. And it's like, why? It could be interpreted one way because of the search and rescue and the police presence, getting on his nerves, hanging around his trailer. If he is supposedly antisocial, he, he probably doesn't feel comfortable. It's annoying him. He wants them to go. And he got that wish when the police bent over backwards, back down in a submissive way and, you know, was more focused on keeping him comfortable than actually solving the case and finding evidence. So that says a lot, doesn't it, about the LE, but once again, no surprise. But then Search and Rescue did the same exact thing, so makes you think there. Um, the other way it could be interpreted would be by the fifth day, if the Rounds family are becoming a bit more involved, a bit more vocal maybe, asking about. Justin as well, the way you know he's been behaving too. Brenner could be getting a bit intimidated or worried or thinking, oh shit, and that defence mechanism of aggression kicks in because that's another thing. Sometimes when people are scared, they can become aggressive. It doesn't really make much sense, but it can happen. Just like how when people are in a sad situation, they might laugh as a form of coping. In terms of getting angry when scared, that's a form of um, the, the fight mode where you try and stand your ground, resist in a way. And that might be what Brenner was doing at the time when he felt that the family were getting a bit too close or, you know put more focus in, so it was getting more serious, it was getting more real now. Brenner didn't feel as invincible at the time. Okay, it could be that. I mean, he is in prison right now, so he's not exactly untouchable, but he could still hold valid, important information which has not been revealed yet, so he still kind of is in control and kind of has that power. You can let me know your thoughts about that if you think, if you agree with that. So, uh, yeah. Anything else? The grain truck in the shed. So, what's this one about? Yeah, so from what Candy said, it was an important question this, and Chris said, when Dylan, or if Dylan was to park his truck, the grain one, in the grain shed, because it was gonna rain, and it was gonna rain for a, over the weekend or so, for a fair bit, what would Dylan do? Where would he go? And Candy said, when something like that occurs, he can't get on with the farming, then he would go to either Candice house or Justin Round's house and stay there for a bit, stop over. As said, what we've heard, Dylan wasn't on the farm 24 seven every single day throughout the whole year. He did move about, as we know, like kind of like a triangular effect, going from here to there to there. So that kind of reinforces it once again. So then when there was, instances where he was denied of farming because of the weather, how things were going, maybe even like a thunderstorm too. You know, he might as well visit a family member, one of the parents, because obviously, I guess they are separate at the time, living in different locations as it worded. So he'd go between the two different ones. So nothing groundbreaking there, but I guess it explains what would have happened then. You know, if Dylan was to park his grain truck in the grain shed this time round on the 28th, okay, that's what he set out to do, and that was on a Saturday, if I'm correct in saying, because um, it was going to rain. He does that, and then if he wasn't to go missing, he would have either been staying at Justin Round's house or Candice Cooley's. So, time back to if Brenner was arrested a year ago in 2021, Dylan right now, well, maybe not right now, because it's it's like two months on, like like a month or two ago, if it was like a long time of rain, Dylan would still be alive, but at one of the parents' house, you know, that's like how it seems to be. So maybe that's something you've not heard of up until now or recent time. I mean, there was, as I said, up to now there's been some good questions and obviously interesting uh, answers, but I think most of the questions are by the general public 
people that watch the mob, mob crew, some people that might watch my videos like Mello, Mella, however you say the name. So yeah, good questions. I mean, this is the thing. When people play down the theories and say, we don't want theories, we don't want speculation, it gets in, in the way of the facts, it drags people away from the truth. But this is the thing, without theories, without questioning, there's no actual questions, right? Okay, so when Candy says, oh, I like all these questions, they're helpful, they're good. That one's a very important question. I'm glad you asked. That's probably derived from a certain theory, a perspective, which might have not been factual, but it was made up of thoughts, which led to that question, which led to that answer, which led to that being cleared up. So you can't dismiss it, okay? So, yeah. As for the militia, Candice did respond to that. She said it's a silly idea about this whole militia and defence group. I wouldn't say it's silly. I mean, if you've got the Wadsworth brothers and they've got friends of friends and there's a like, little group or there's a little gathering, it doesn't have to be completely militaristic. It might just be little patrols. Who knows what they get up to out there? I've not seen it, but witnesses have, such as Tiff and one of her friends in the past has witnessed it. And that was before Dylan went missing, if I'm correct in saying. Um... If I'm wrong, Tiff, feel free to correct me, but if those like militia, those guys with guns were present from what you've told in the chat, and that was before Dylan went missing, then it means that they were around back then. So in, in the words of like Candice or Chris bringing it up, that oh, they just suddenly appeared when Dylan went missing. No, no, if they existed back then, uh, it's something more set in stone, so it could be tied in with the whole Dylan Brown's case in some way, and it could be tied in with Chase Venstra being beaten up and bloodied, whether it be chased down or just simply attacked for maybe trying to steal something, as people suggested. So I think the militia are present in some way, somewhere. I don't know if they're a vigilante group or just plain, plain out bandits. Who knows? I mean, the environment itself is rough and rugged, so you might get rough and rugged people different factions forming and if Dylan is in the epicenter of it all or gets caught up in it at some point someplace you know there could be crosswise there could be confrontation so you can't I wouldn't say it's a silly idea um the idea of a militia when you look more into it but you know that it's just Candice and her opinion at the end of the day so it's just how she thinks okay fair enough next point Brenner allowed to move the grain truck so this is all to do with June the 2nd, the spring cleaning. I can do a video on that as well, possibly. Maybe tie things little things in together. But Candice basically said, on the 2nd of June, Brenner was allowed to move the grain truck out of the grain shed in order to, to take items out of the grain shed. You know, the truck obscuring the entrance, take it out, drive it out, take items out of the shed and then put them wherever. And maybe even the grain truck as well. There's any items in there, in the, the cab, in the, the back of the truck, take things out. And that all happened from what Candy said whilst the LE, Box Elder County, were present, sat down, watching. They did nothing. Tell me that's, that's normal. It's not, is it? You got a crime scene. Okay, there's no tape, but you got a crime scene with a police presence in most normal situations, if a stranger, oh, low battery, if a stranger or general public was just to come walking along and cross that boundary of the tape and start picking something up, the police would instantly, you know, either arrest or push back the individual and say, hey, hey, what are you doing? Well, you can't be here at this moment in time. Or even if it's a person that lives at a house or nearby to a neighbour, and it's been cornered off and they're going back to the house and they're like, no, no, you, you can't enter, you can't go back in, you can't touch anything, it's a crime scene. And yet, in the Dylan Rouse case, Box Elder County were like, ah, oh, look at Brenner, look at him moving all that stuff around, look at all those items, I wonder what they could be. Could be Dylan, could be some clothing, could be a bit of evidence, we'll just sit back and let him move his stuff around because we don't want to aggravate him anymore. I mean, you could be disposing of evidence, but oh, oh well, that's not normal. None of that is. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think any of that could have been Dil uh, could have been linked to Dylan? 
in some way and the police were aware that there might have been evidence associated with that but they were like oh well so not looking good once again just more stuff and you know like how candy said more evidence destroyed if Brenner was moving items about just simply even moving the truck itself just moving the truck itself it is fingerprints on the wheel on the door handle and Brenner's getting inside of it it might ruin the evidence so there's none to look at and that might be why at a later point when certain items that were taken in to the lab for inspection they didn't find anything and then the police just wrote off and said yeah you can take it back home now collect it and that's it without actually processing certain evidence and findings because maybe there wasn't any because uh, they witnessed Brenner ruin it in the first place but maybe the police were thinking oh you're doing us a job you're doing us a favor you know instead of us getting our hands dirty we'll just let the suspects carry on doing this thing yeah I don't that's not it's not looking good is it now moving on to the next point that was brought up the whole dirt mound situation so I believe it was you know looked at and investigated dug up as well if I'm correct in saying it doesn't look like it, it doesn't appear but you know that's what's been said the main point though what Candice put across was there's no tracks leading up to the dirt mound now in 2019 it appears there is tracks maybe that's changed with time with present time no one's been there since driving up to it because it's not in use anymore maybe in terms of the visual look of the dirt mound there's weeds growing out so obviously it's not been touched it's not been disturbed i guess i guess that's the case i mean with the boots being found around the back or by the side of the dirt mound it's telling isn't it because if someone was trying to hide those boots they would have maybe dug a hole somewhere in the mound and then shoved them in but they didn't even do that so it does make you question doesn't it but it also reinforces that the mound hasn't really been touched either so there's not too much suspicion around the mound itself I guess um, in terms of the tracks there's been quite a few track marks and I assume that's in reference to Chris's images or Heavy D's, whoever took them when in a helicopter overlooking the farm, the grain shed. You see all the track marks left, right and centre. And Candice basically said um, it's just by search and rescue and the police, you know, going back and forth in the area, looking around, exploring in their vehicles, their buggies or whatever they use. Uh, the horseback as well too and just footprints so all that can be explained and cleared up but you know this is where the maps come in handy you look back on google earth you go back in time whether it be sun tunnel whether it be uh, one of the lakes or near dylan's farm or the grain shed you look at the ground and there are several track marks, turnabouts, donuts, drifting track marks, cut throughs, dozens of them. And that was in 2019. And you can't say that was because of police and search and rescue because Dylan didn't go missing in 2019. So there was already quite a bit of activity going on back then. There might have been even more or an equal amount up to 2022 before Dylan went missing. And it's like, well, who else is out there? Is it people cutting through? Is it the militia driving by in groups and numbers? Is it biker gangs? Who knows? Is it tourists? Could be anyone. So you can't just write it all completely off and say all the track marks, search, rescue and police. In recent time, yeah, that can be explained by them. But before that, there was other people out there. And that's the question, who were they? Were any of them associated with Dylan's disappearance down the line or just random passerbyers? Feel free to let me know what you think. I mean, if you got those people camping out there or, uh, the night before Dylan went missing or so and they saw Dylan in his tractor, that could explain some of the track marks too. So we're taking that in mind as well. Um, okay, what else is there? The boots. So just referring back to the boots the way they were placed. They weren't placed down gently, they were tossed. Like you got them in your hand like that. Like, what's, what's an example? Pretend that's like a boot, completely different clothing. Hold it arm's length and 
chuck it like that and then it just like separates like that so if they were tossed was that in a rush was that with force or anything like that i don't know more associated when when you toss something is because you don't really care it's like oh just toss it who cares like that so if there's a lack of care then could that be dylan is he the type i mean if he's in a rush he could have tossed them just like how he might toss food on the side in his trailer if he's uh, going on to do something and he's in a rush or hurry neglecting certain things possibly um but you'd think it'd be more of a suspect because it wouldn't make sense for Dylan to take his shoes off and then, what, just walk the ground voluntary with sh without shoes. That's not normal. So it's less likely Dylan. Though what Candice said, Candice said Brenner at the time said to Candice that they were tossed and that Dylan did it because he had enough of something of the place. And then that ties in with Brenner saying he hasn't seen Dylan in months. How does that make sense? If those boots were put there in recent time, the day or two before Dylan went missing, or on the day or day after Dylan went missing, and that's when they appeared, um, how can how can Brenner say, oh yeah, Dylan um, threw the boots down around the dirt mound, and then suddenly say, well, I've not seen him for a month. And it's like, yeah, but you said you saw him put the boots down and now you're saying you've not seen him for a long time. What's going on there? And, you know, if you didn't know all the ins and outs, you could assume that, oh, well, maybe it was a month ago when Brenner saw Dylan chuck the boots round the dirt mound and he's not been seen in that area since. That would explain. But that's obviously not the case because Dylan actually made a phone call to the grandmother successfully on the 28th of May and he was on the farm and he did successfully park the grain truck in the grain shed as he set out to do so. So he was on the farm at the time and what, Dil uh, and what Brenner said about not seeing Dylan for a month, that was obviously a lie. And with Brenner lying, it makes him more guilty and more suspicious, right? Because why would you lie? How do you benefit or like, what's even the reasoning behind it? Who cares if you've seen him chuck the boots down or not? Uh, but then why would you say, oh, you've not seen him for a long time? So um, maybe when he says he saw Dylan chucking the boots around the, uh, the dirt mound, he basically meant he himself did it. But obviously he's not going to say he did it because he'd get in trouble. So, yeah. And obviously we're tying on to more present time with what we've seen in developments with Whatever, it, whatever test it was about, with Brenner lying and uh, failing in that polygraph reader test, the lie detector test, he failed on that. So not only did he fail on that, but he also lied as well about the Boots and Dylan not being found uh, since a month ago. So yeah, that does make him look more of a suspect or the suspect. Let me know your thoughts about that because it is quite an important point, right? And a, quite a big contradiction from seeing him to not seeing him. So, yeah. Anyway, another important point to throw in, and this links back once again to Box Elder County and how they've handled stuff roundabout on day two with the whole cadaver, cadaver dogs for searching, for looking for Dylan, remains, scent, that sort of stuff. It was said that on day two, Bucks Elder County, from what Candice said in the live stream and what she eventually found out, was Bucks Elder County called off the Bloodhound unit due to the rain. They believed it was a 20% chance success rate of locating Dylan. So it would have been a waste of time, basically. So that's why Box Elder County decided to poke their nose in once again and prevent an opportunity of finding Dylan. And that was day two. That's not good. Now, some people could be like, yeah, well, if it drops down to a 20% chance because of rain, it might be a waste of time. It might not work. But, you know, when, when you're against time 
and you're in a rush and you need to find the person as soon as possible, who cares what the chance says, whether it increases or drops? If you've got the chance to do it, the opportunity, then just do it. Okay, so like with the dogs, you've got the dogs present, just do it now. 20% chance, maybe you might get lucky, maybe you might find it. If you don't, well, can't you just do it again? Or is it because of the cost? I mean, it can't be more expensive than a, a helicopter flying about and then refueling, right? So, it's weird. Once again, Box Elder County stepping in to prevent progression being made, to delay things. That's what they're all about. Being lenient towards criminals when they shouldn't be. Allowing things to happen when they shouldn't. Delaying certain processes and so on. Really not looking good. Did any of you know about the Bloodhound unit being called off? And, you know, do you think back then, day two, if Box Elder County didn't step in and they allowed the Bloodhound unit, the dog unit, to sniff around, do you think they would have found Dylan back then? Or do you think they might have at least found some important evidence that might tie on to a new lead? And, you know... If they didn't, if they didn't allow Brenner to get in the way and start doing the spring cleaning as well, alongside with the whole Bloodhound unit, maybe it could have all tied in together. Maybe the Bloodhounds could have found something in the grain shed or nearby. Who knows? Because they've got the scent, they've got the nose for it. So, yeah, interesting. Is that it for the notes there? I think so. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'll just move on to the last few notes. Okay, not too many more. Oh my god, the, right, the paper has kind of recovered, okay, I just need to stretch my neck for a second because crippled at the moment, I'm crippled, but yeah, I said, a little mini break, you can leave your thoughts down below, what you think so far, um, yeah, I noticed, well, obviously you wouldn't notice, you haven't seen it, but I have a pocket there, I really don't know what the point of it is. Is it to store a pen in or a pencil? It's a bit short, isn't it? And why is it on the side? Why is it not going across and then it drops down in? I mean, I really don't understand. And no, it's not one of those like little access points what you might find elsewhere where, oh, you unzip. Oh, what surprise does it reveal today? Oh, let's have a look. No, it's not like that. And I'll demonstrate now. Sorry to disappoint you, but yes. Fucking hell, that zips hard. When you pull up and down, it's. It, I think it needs oiling. Damn. It's a bit tough. Well, if I open the pocket, it's just darkness. Darkness, like an abyss. When you stare into it, it stares back right at you. What do you see in there? You know, last night, when the questions were asked, Brookie, do you have any fears? Hmm? Are you hiding certain information? Is it deep within here, like Pandora's box, and you're keeping it shut for now? Maybe someday it will open. Who knows? Shit, I nearly knocked the water over. That's the worst thing that could happen. The only thing I can think of would be this pocket. You unzip, you put your hand in. My hand's a bit big, so I can't quite fit it in. And then... Then, like, then what do you do when your hand's in the pocket? Bear in mind, this pocket is hovering over the nipple area. So I don't know what's the use of it. Put your hand in, squeeze maybe? I don't know, why would you be squeezing? I don't know. Mm, I don't really feel much when I squeeze it. No, I'm not excited. No. Not my thing. Anyway, let's return back to um, some of the additional notes, okay? So with the gate, you know, you've heard about the gate before. I, I guess it's like kind of like a bit of a flimsy one with a black pole or bar going across with barbed wire fencing too. It's not high security, but then again, it doesn't really need to be. It does make me think though, you know, if vehicles aren't being locked up, you know, Dylan never locks his vehicle because there's no need to. Maybe the same applies to Jim Brenner as well. Then why does there need to be a gate that needs to be locked to access to the grain shed? Like, what's the point? 
maybe it's well it can't really be for security is it more for privacy maybe or just i'm not sure but the gate whether it be locked unlocked the whole dispute and you know arguments around all that as some of you have brought up yourself because some of you in the past thought maybe the gate situation that might have led to Brenner getting a bit angry, losing control, and then taking it out on Dylan, possibly. Candy said that as far as the gate situation goes and the disagreements, that has been ongoing for at least three years. So that's a long time. A little bit petty, but a long time. So that could have led to a build-up of frustration and anger with that time. You never know. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. She does say, though, it's not relevant in this case, Candice. And obviously, with the previous one, with No Thanks, that interview, she said certain points aren't relevant there either, such as the pivot and the farmland Dylan was seeding on. But, you know, all these little points can tie in, though. You never know. And there is disputes about the gate. Even if it dates back three years ago, maybe he's finally had enough, Jim. And if he snaps, he snaps. And if it is a dispute... As we know, he's had disputes in the past, like the, the Maryland uh, shooting. So, yeah, I think it is kind of relevant. Maybe not groundbreaking, but relevant as a potential motive if Jim was responsible for Dylan's disappearance. Then, moving on, and very briefly, because I did make a video earlier, as I said, Chris did mention the question of there's someone in recent time that's claimed to have had contact with Jim Brenner. Candice replies and says, oh yeah, Brookie, and gives her thoughts and opinions on her. Now, if you want to hear what was said, like the audio of it, the video, I do have a video of it covering it briefly in my earlier video today. I said there's a link down below in the comment section Make sure to click on it and watch it and see what you think about it and as well my additional thoughts afterwards talking about it. So, yeah. But it's interesting to think, I wonder what could happen next. Was Brookie watching, listening in? I know the alt account Brookie was watching because then they made a comment on my video last night. Must have occurred at the same time, possibly. I'm not, sure, I'm not quite sure. Saying that, oh, Candice has exposed me. You know, you, you would have seen the odd comment like that. So, it makes me think, fam. I don't know what time that interview live stream took place on the Mob Cruise channel. It happened last night. I know there's a time zone difference with the US and the UK, but for me, it happened last night. But it must have been, was it during or after my stream? I started my live premiere live chat last night at what 9:15 p.m. UK time or was it 9:30 I can't remember that which deadline I touched upon but was that during the time frame of when the mob crew went live I don't know because if so um credit to all the people that were present in the chat on my video I appreciate that and um, it was quite lively as well, so it, it was it was fun. So that's all good. That r regardless of uh, additional streams taking place at the same time. So yeah, that's that's acknowledged. Now moving on, in terms of Brenner, once again, Brenner came out with some stories and responses. Aside from the boot situation and not seeing Dylan for a month, Brenner did say at one point, and I think it was directly to Candice was Dylan wasn't at the grain shed, um, or he wasn't at the grain shed at the time, because um, he was at Don Hatley's farm, or trailer, RV, whatever it is, between 2.30 and 3 o'clock. I assume that's later on in the day. Said they were having dinner, some kind of barbecue, uh, and Brenner said the grain... The grain truck was not in the grain shed when leaving to go to dinner. You know, it might have been slightly misworded that. I don't know if it means when Brenner was getting ready to go out to visit Don Hatley's place. And as he was leaving, he didn't see any sign of Dylan at the time. 
or activity at the grain shed or if it means it was like a day before or on the day and when coming back afterwards later on at night you didn't see any activity at the grain shed I'm not sure how it's worded but either way what we know ourselves in terms of evidence the grain truck was parked in the grain shed Dylan was responsible for that because that's what he said he was going to do um, so once again Brenner must be lying saying he's not seen Dylan the grain truck's not been moved and yet it has been so he's lied Brenner is he hiding yet more stuff once again and what does Don Hatley think about all this okay if Brenner was supposedly out and about elsewhere visiting Don does Don back up that story or not I've not heard much about that that would be interesting to know to see what Don thinks about it is he going to cover for Jim or is he going to say no Brenner never visited me don't know what he's on about he was still at the grain shed well I've not heard any responses to that regarding Don himself as we'll see in uh, another question maybe if it might be answered maybe anything else Candice, um, she, yeah, it kind of ties in with what I was just saying then. Candice said she is surprised at how little Don H knows about the situation with Dylan, like the outcome, considering they were kind of close, living nearby in a sense, might be a six mile distance between the two, the farms. And, um, you know, with Don maybe being in the presence of Brenner at some point, it's like a triangle effect again. You know, they all kind of link to one another, so you all have some kind of interaction. But you got Brenner lying, and you got Don H like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I don't really know. I don't have much information. And it's like, what is going on? You know, do I have the splash blessings of Tyler upon your soul like this to make you confess? Confess. Confess, Brookie. Confess anyone and everyone. Please. Oh, no. I don't want to mess up the mic. Right, just got to do um, an on-the-spot check of the microphone because I, I don't want the audio to be corrupt. Okay. Um, how do I do this? I, I was I was going to use the top to try and wipe the microphone, but then I've got to lift the top up, and uh, I'm not doing that. Um, I'll do. <sighs> Sound like a fucking dog. Damn. Right, that's okay. Is that one okay? Okay. It's it's all fine. That's good. Okay. So yeah, Brenner's story's not quite adding up, making lies and Don acting like he doesn't know anything. Are they covering for one another? It makes you think, but still, Don did grass up Brenner with the whole gun situation, so it kind of rules that one out. Unless Don is the main guy responsible, so he throws Jim under the bus. It's then Don's seen as a good person for doing a good a good deed, um, and then he carries on acting dumb like he doesn't know anything himself personally because he is the main one responsible. I mean. Out of the three main guys, I mean, you can include Robert Avales, but I don't know too much about him. But the three main guys who know Dylan in some way, Jim Brenner, Chase Fenstra, Don Hatley, two of, two of which are in prison right now. If I'm correct in saying about Venstra as well, in jail, because of gun charges, not to do with Dylan. Okay? So Don Hatley is like the clean one, the one with a lesser criminal history person who seems to be a bit more in control, not as aggressive or bad. But sometimes the silent, quiet people can be just as dangerous, if not more, and can do bad stuff. Just like uh, when you come across people that appear innocent and uh, very naughty. Okay. So when you take that into mind, that could explain Don's behaviour. You can leave your thoughts down below. I'll do another poll once again. Is Don Hatley responsible? Or word it differently. With Don Hatley acting like he doesn't know anything, is that true? 
or does he actually know something but he's not going to reveal it because it'll get him in trouble directly and directly maybe okay so that aside is there anything else to mention the le once again so i don't know if this highlights corruption or just simply lack of professionalism okay so from what candy said in the live stream she also mentioned that the le have not cleared the rounds family the parents justin or candice have not been cleared and at the same time they've not been questioned either interviewed you know you know if someone's treated as a suspect they're taken in for questioning interrogated whether they like it or not part of the procedure none of that has happened so nothing's been cleared up so it's still kind of left in the open and although the parents know they're not responsible low battery again shit although the parents know they're not responsible I guess legally or officially it's still pending I guess and it's like well what are the LE doing there is it because they truly believe the parents are suspicious or is it just because they really are reckless and careless of the entire case and everyone involved whether it be the criminals the supposed criminals, the criminals, the family members, friends, evidence, it's just all one big joke to them. And it could be, because Candice did report saying, in the, the live stream, saying how the the LE were making jokes, mocking the parents and laughing behind their backs and stuff, which isn't professional either, you know? Would you call it bullying? Not really, but it's being disrespectful in a way and that lack of professionalism so let me know what you think about that the next interesting point mentioned by candice was to do with ivan the one who owned lucin airport he wasn't present at the time of dylan's disappearance in fact ivan was in ogden with his plane can't remember for what reason but okay he wasn't there i can still do a video about the airport or about ivan himself a little backstory if you would like that as well I can do a video. I have these notes down to certain videos, but can only do one at a time, obviously. Um, and if they're really long, and can only really do one in a day, unless I do two short ones. But we'll see how things, you know, play out and stuff. Because if there is breaking news along the way, or these little interviews, well, not little, little big interviews coming out here and there, then there's more focus and shift on that stuff, because it's more relevant and important but definitely looking at the airport could be an alternative feature because not saying that Ivan is responsible for Dylan's disappearance or involved but the actual area the the building itself and if there's any like aircraft around it could have been used by somebody else who knows we're taking in mind now the wash that was another point mentioned by Chris Chris from the mob crew who's previously been out there, boots on ground, as well as using drones, aerial view to get an idea of what's what, looking back at footage, analysing, finding out that there's track marks within the wash, thought there were excavators, ATVs, something going on. Who could it be? Why would they do that? Candice was able to respond, reply and answer, and explained, saying those track marks were caused by some kind of equipment at the hands of search and rescue. So search and rescue call step. So nothing dodgy, nothing suspicious. Case closed with that point. So that's good. Loose end tied up. And as I said, um, some people might have been really questioning it over time. So I guess it puts people minds at ease. So maybe other things can be cleared up along the way. And another final point, okay? This is like the final point that stood out in my mind. Tying on with Lance Kelly and, you know, the recent videos by him and Heavy D. So in terms of the mines in Lucin, I assume, within an appropriate radius, every single accessible mine, mine shaft, has been explored and cleared from a volunteer group. Okay, that's what Candice said. They kind of like remain anonymous because they don't want to be in the limelight, they don't want the attention, fair enough. But yeah, they've checked all the mines and not found Dylan. Now, question is, how many mines and mine shafts? I mean, okay, they've done everyone accessible. Couple, they didn't because they were filled in or 
there was no possible way of getting in. So, you know, it's good what they've done, but there's a possibility that there's any others out there which they might have not looked at. If not, then okay, they've done good, and that rules out the idea of Dylan being down one. But what about Lance Kelly? Okay, not losing Montello, but Lance Kelly has been looking at mine shafts along with Ty Corbin. Ty Corbin stands on the outside because he's not um, comfortable going into those, you know, small spaces, which it makes sense, understandable. But you know he's he's took he's tagged along and Heavy D's come in recently with his resources and group of guys and crew and uh, climbing down, abseiling down certain mine shafts and dark pits, looking about. Not found anything yet, but you never know. So it's good you got this volunteer group in Lucin checking off every mine, and you got Lance and uh, Heavy D's crew going about checking theirs in Montello, Nevada. So. It's good how it's being checked off as you go along. You can leave your thoughts down below. One, do you think Dylan is in a mine shaft? And two, do you think the groups exploring and investigating have searched all of them? Or do you think there's a possibility there might be a secret one somewhere? Or one they've not heard of? Who knows? So, uh, yeah, the only negative is, and it's like, oh, here we go again. So with this group, the volunteer one, all the effort they've done, all the work they've put in, time, energy, risk, it's not been acknowledged by Box Elder County when, whether it be the mother or Candice or the volunteer group saying, hey, we've checked the mines out, this one's been ticked off, that and that. Box Elder County are like, you know, we're not really interested. So, why? Is it because it doesn't mean much to them? If it doesn't mean much to them, that's probably why it doesn't mean much to them overall as the case. But, yeah, it, it's not looking good. It's just point after point, you know. We thought we've already heard enough about Box Elder County, but more bits of info keeps coming out. And obviously that's probably at the hands of all these questions which have been created, which are good by viewers on any channel in the community of the Dylan Rouse case. So there you go. Bit more of a understanding of what's going on. Who knows what will happen next? Um you can leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you've got questions or if you need to correct any information, feel free to do so. I hope you enjoyed this live premiere and the information and it made enough sense to you, hopefully. And yeah, that's it for me. Um, I'll see you next time in my next video. Thanks for watching, appreciate it and good night.
Peekaboo. Yes, I'm still watching. I can see you.